then switching it into our presentation. Now we're going to be involved with Professor Robert Morris about the presentation of the Indian scale. Professor Robert Morris from the Eastern School of Women's and Professor Rochester. And I had a pleasure to work with him last year, then here, uh, in my dissertation. So it's an honor to have you here in Brazil to present this important talk. So, Professor Robert Morris.
this rotor, another rotor might have the same scale but not have that slot there, and that makes it different. Now we'll look at the southern um, school or And listen to the run of irony. Now, what about that? You might have heard some uh, sliding and notes, but the actual scale is not da 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 but it's played da 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 So the, uh, the uh, oscillations in South Indian music are very confusing for the last years. It sounds like they play different notes than they actually play. Uh, so we're going to listen to a little more of this.
Here's a different raga called Garuda Dwani, and it's at a major scale up and a pentatonic scale down. And I have an example of this. Scale degrees, 
and it can be denoted by PCs. Down at the bottom, we have a little Q. That's one. And uh, that can be written as pitch class as a 01589. And similarly, the next scale can be written this way too. Scale is. Right. We can transpose uh, scales enharmonically, and exactly as we do in uh, set theory or small tone theory, we write an operator TN, operates on the scale, and you move up by two pitch classes in the case of T2, and then you transform the scale back to scale degrees and half. All right, so that's pretty simple. We can also invert scales. This is something that Indians, that Indian scholars don't know about, or if they do, they don't talk about it, but we're gonna be thinking about this in the talk. You can take the scale degrees and invert them, and these are the chromatic ones, so you tone too, sh too sharp is inverted into seven vertical <coughs> flat. That's, of course, the PCs three and nine, which are inversions of each other. And there you see some examples down below. Uh, the first one is one sharp two, three, five, flat six, and the second day inversion of that is one, three, four, flat six, double flat seven. And then write the inversion of scale rather than downward right in the center. We can also rotate a scale to start with a different scale degree. And then we can put these together to form a TRN operation. And what that does, I'm not going to go into all the details, it transposes the scale and then it locates the tonic of the, the note that you've transposed to becomes the new tonic. Okay. So this is like when we change the Dorian mode into the Fujian mode. We transpose and then we uh, change, uh, change the Dorian uh, with what notes the tonic. All right. Now we're going to get into a little history here. Um, Indian music has a lot of theoretic writing about it. It's intertwined with other subjects like uh, cultural and religious things, but there is a theory in there. And um, in the uh, 19th century, early 20th century, uh, this man named Vishnu Narayan Bhattakande was interested in seeing if there were a group of scales that all around us fit in. He came up first empirically by talking to musicians and listening to music. Places. came up with 32 basic scales. He thought that was a little extravagant, so he boiled, he, 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 uh, boiled that down to 10 scales. That's what a top is. A top is one of the 10 scales. On the other hand, the 72 melos or melocarta scales, sometimes misleading in the court, melocarta ragas. Notice that a rag is a very complicated object, uh, so these things should be called mel uh, scales. Uh, Rogas should be called scales, so that's what they are. And the scale of Mela is a basic scale. And the way this worked is, about 1640, the Indian musicologist and Captain Machen proposed a system of 32 scales, but it was a little fuzzy. Uh, sometimes uh, the scales were altered in certain ways because uh, the theorist in question was trying to make them harmonious. Um, but another theorist came along about uh, a generation later, Vibhacharya, and he adjusted the Takanaka system to prove the Sanpornia formal, complete seven tone scales. And now that's what you have uh, handed out to you. You have the Tots on one sheet written in musical notation, and you have the seven two Benagata scales there. I will be referring to this from time to time. So, uh, now notice the um, Tots study was an empirical study. I went out and looked at what people were playing. In this case, this is a theoretic study with a cardiac situation. And it was the case that some of the mailas or scales that were proposed were not used yet in music. And later, as time went on, they began to be uh, used by composers. And now all of them are introduced today. It's interesting where theories lead in practice in this case. So here's a list of the 10 dots, OK? And uh, maybe I'll play each one. How young is this?
And uh, next one is uh, Mara. Or you're just not correct. Okay. What? Let's check that. <laughs> Tritones, and we have the super Raleigh, which is the name of the 
out what is the tone, is the scale tone, which is one of the dots. All right? And if we keep on going with this method, we'll change G sharp to G sharp, and we get a hex chord to G uh, scale, the Brudonian hex chord, which is the source of many lagas. And then we can change D to B flat, and we get a hex flat scale when the process is finished. No, these are the 32 sound body scales. Sound body means nice for a pleasant uh, or first. Um, and these scales are simply ones that can be derived from the Hindisani system by taking either the flat or the natural version of each note. Now there are five notes that have that possibility, the second, third, fourth, sixth, and seventh. And so there are five possibilities of the, uh, a choice of two that gives us two to the uh, fifth power, which was just the very few scales. Okay. These scales might be composed, might be used by Western composers once in a while. But you can see a wall of the side here. Um, these at the top, so they fit right in this net, all right there. These other scales, although are, are used by Hindustani musicians quite often, like Sarasaki or Shalokishi or etc. So that's one way we can think about in the Hindustani situations in lodging the system to get to 32, which might have been 32 that Makanda talked about over option. And then we can order them so they become parsimonious. And what that means is when you go from one scale to the next, one thing changes by one semitone. So when you go up here, we start out with being a long major scale, we change that flat, that seventh flat. The next one we change from six to flat. The next one is we change the seventh to natural. Now that this time we change the four, 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 sharp four, and it keeps it going like this. If you notice these columns, we have two and then two natural, two um, flat. This one you have four and four. This one you have a five, doesn't matter because it doesn't change. Uh, four, you have eight and eight, 16, 16, 32, essentially alternating. So that gives you a change of one scale degree each time. This uh, thing we call the Gwani code is a way of putting things together where you change one at a time. It's very useful in partitions, by the way, because if you change one aspect of partition at a time, it goes through all of them without a repetition. All right, so this is a more complicated way of doing this, which gives you many more possibilities than a gray code, but it's the same idea. Uh, the top here is, is Two flat alone, we add three flat, we take three flat alone. So the front, across the top, we have a simple little uh, diagram where there's one thing changing each time until we get to here, where there's nothing happening that is all natural. And the same thing goes out here six and six flat, and then uh, six flat and seven flat, and then six flat alone, and nothing. And what's in here is the whatever is in the columns and row, or rows that might be the head, heads of the rows of the, uh, the columns. That's the combination of those two things. So if we start, for instance, we look at this column right here, this will be the sixth flat alone. Right? And this one down here will be no flats or sharps. This will be flat, flat three, sharp four, flat six. And what we do is we just start and I'll replace and do a, 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 a walk through this. We're considering this to, uh, graph to be uh, wrap around both uh, uh, vertically and horizontally, so 1 to 2, 3 to 4, 5 to 6, 7, and 8, 9, 10, 11, and 7. So we get that 32, which is here, which is adjacent to 1. So it's the same. Uh, this cartograph idea is very useful in other like forms of music. I use a lot of my own compositions to go through a, a set of objects in a very smooth way. And then, of course, you can deviate from that smoothness in a principle way, too. But anyway, returning to the scales, here's how that works. This, there are many possibilities of, doing, of making these kinds of graphs. So this is one of the goals. And now it's not so nice uh, as it was before where things change in different ways of speed. The, uh, there may be a, a situation where there's a lot of sevens for a while, and then some sevens, last sevens, like that. So this is more interesting uh, arrangement. Now let's go into the Vela system. The Vela is 72 scales, constructed from tetrachords. 
Well, we're not perfect. So here's the bottom technical of the scale, and it could be one, two flat, three double flat, or written in Western notation, C, E flat, E double flat, F. Yeah. And it's combined with this one up here, five, six, flat, seven, eight. And that's the first scale of the middle part. We get the second scale, we take this again, and take the second one to the top ten. Yeah, we do the third one is take this, and here, and then we're finished. And we're going to do the scale here. And we do the whole thing over again, and again, and again, and again, until we get to this place. These scales from seven to 12 are the same ones here, except they have a sharp form. Okay? And that will give you all the mayor products. It's a very nice system, very clean, pretty. And this just explains how the number works. The number is you should just count it along as you do this. Uh, so this is two, three, four, five, six. You can find this with that, seven, eight, nine, ten, etc. Okay. Here's another way of looking at it. You have these four lower technical chords, and you have these four other lower technical chords with a sharp four. You take one of them or more, or one more, and then you can take them either one of these or these, one of your chosen. And then you have these up here, which are upper ones, you take one of those and end it, and so all the combinations will be used in the And here are the scales. I'm not going to play them all, but I'll probably have a first number 39 is not nice. <laughs>
And oddly enough, the system the source for okay. And then we have these other set classes like this, which are like a complete dominant seven chord. Maybe you need something like a major sixth chord or fifth version or something. And then this one, which is of course three notes on the major scale. And those are the kinds of triads you get out of here. Um, Now we deal with an all third notochord scales. These are scales in which, let's take five of them here. Okay, so we go and make thirds. One to three, three to four.
So this poses some questions about how to enumerate the, um, the scales themselves that are subsets. Because you might find that you can get one mail to generate one, and you're going to get different mail that has different scaling ways, but are in a mock. So in the top here, we have uh, five tones, one, five, three, four, five, seven, plus seven. And the next scale there is one sharp, two, four, five, seven. These could be derived from two different mail and they're equivalent, though, however, in a mock. So the question is, how do you do this? How do you how do you figure this out? Well, think about the pitch classes, okay, and arrange them this way. So pitch class one to four, that has to have two notes in between in that space. The space between five and six can have one note in there. That's an F sharp amount. Five is simply seven, so there's no choice there. And then from the eighth to the eleventh pitch class, you can put two notes in there. All right, so you figure out how that works. How many ways can you put two notes in four places? Six. How many ways can you put two notes in uh, one note in two places? Two. And then again, the sixth of the up. Six. So when you add, uh, sum those up, you get 72. Okay. And uh, so with five tones, that's what's shown there, one by the number of choices. For five tone scales, you start again with the gap from one to four but you choose one pitch class in there rather than two. So how many choices do you have? Four, all right? And then the, with the F sharp and F, you have a choice of uh, either one. And then the upper tetrachord is going to be, uh, you can choose a, a six orderings from that because it, it, you have two pitch classes in there. And then you sum those, four times two times one times six, you get 48. The next chart shows this using the standard combinatorial notation for these choices. And you can see the first one on the top shows you that um, you're going to get 72 scales. That's the Mellon Garnet right on top. Now the six BC scales, in the first case, need this. So we, this is the place that we take a PC from. So now it's not, it's one out of four rather than two out of four. Here we, these are the same, and we get what we get on the other side of the page. But in this case, we could take one of the, uh, just take away uh, the F or F sharp altogether, and then we get this. We can't do anything here because this is the fifth. Fifth is no, it's just a single place. But you can delete it, and if you delete it, you get 72 again. That's just taking every Melbourne scale, taking away the fifth. And then of course down here you have the inverse of this. This changes to just that, you get the same number, 204 is the answer. And then we can do this in more complicated ways. Take one from here, 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 so we'll get to the bottom. And then we have, in this case, 236. Now, there is a paper out there written by an anthropologist uh, that used combinatorial, uh, combinatorics, which is uh, using complicated generating functions to enumerate. And he makes, he does the same thing here. Uh, and uh, he gets the right numbers. But the problem is that doesn't tell you anything about the structure. Here you can see the how the structure works out. Now with the eight PC scales, we're going to add a PC to this place here. So we have four, we have three, three ways to do that. Right? And then here, of course, that's everything we can do. Uh, take one here, and I take one from here, we take one from here. So we're taking two notes out from each of the scales. Notice when we take the fifth away, uh, there's no way to do that. Because the fifth is, you know, we take it away, it's, there's no choice. So consequently, that doesn't give you any answers at all. So there are no five, eight PC scales that have been a fifth. Right. The same thing goes uh, for the bottom. Now, a part of six tone scale has more than one parent scale. I was just talking about that a moment ago. For instance, one, two, three, five, seven, and these seven, seven, and these scales. Now, musicians say that the lowest Mela number is the one to use. So you look at all the Mela's that include the scale you're looking at, and then you choose the lowest number. But in this case, it doesn't actually work that way. Tradition puts the scale in a later Mela, and that should be from that criteria. Uh, these kinds of exceptions happen always in music, and you know, you get used to the fact that you have to make adjustments all the time away from the theory. But the with the theory is pretty 
we need near practice. Uh, now, then we have the Adolfo scale, and of course, this could be classified in male of 22, uh, or it could be classified in male of 22 is the Nordic scale, male of 28 is the Mixolydian scale. Uh, now, what if we have more than seven? Okay, so where was the fire being in? And when you hear this scale, you'll hear that on the way up, it has a major six, on the way down, it has a minor six. So, we've got eight tones there. which by the way is called um, fire B2. So consequently that's the one it goes in. And um, the reason for that is not only really clear because both of those notes are used in the scale. So this is another example of tradition deciding the question that is in the The sharper notes are those that are added to a mela, all right? And in this case, for instance, we could show how these are derived from fifth cycles. So for instance, suppose we have a four and a sharp four in a scale, in the major scale. You can develop that by simply taking the major scale and adding another fifth to it, F sharp. That gives you this. If you take this scale, you'll be from B flat to E, that's a Lydian scale of B flat, and then add a B, you get flat seven. And all these combinations, we have like three, two, flat two, and then uh, are derived from the fifth so they're, just, they're not just arbitrary notes that are added. They seem to have a uh, significance in terms of this. Down here, here's two different Shonga notes in the Rani um, And in this case, we have flat, flat three and normal three, seven flat and seven. And in this Raga here, Kananda uh, Bhairavi, we have uh, these combinations, et cetera. And then we get up here, there's one Raga called Sindhu Bhairavi, which has all 12 pitches in it. I'll play you the scale of this. Sounds like something by Bach back in the But I mean, down when we think every note is a deflection. Okay. So, Cindy Byerby is a very popular model, right? Now, here's one problem that we have. Males don't really distinguish between ragas that have a strong fourth and those that have a weaker non-existing fifth. There are many ragas that don't have a fifth. Just about to play that view, leave it there. There's a raga called Mawit in Hindustani music, which starts out on flat seven, flat, uh, sorry, uh, normal seven, flat two, three, sharp four, Skips over the fifth, it's a six flat, seven, eight, okay, that's fine. But what you get here, the way they think of it is F sharp to uh, six, six flat, F sharp to uh, uh, A flat, back to F sharp, then to F. That's why you look at that one.
we would now be expanding the name of today. There are two people who have tried to do this in the literature, some Mamurthy, who said, okay, take every Mela scale and combine it with every other Mela scale, including itself, um, one going up, one going down. So that's obviously 72 squared, which is what that number is. Uh, Subramanian goes even further, and he says, let's take a look at all the possible five tone sets and six tone sets and their combinations, and see how many we get. And we get about a quarter of a million. So that's a very extravagant uh, uh, set of scales. Maybe in you know like three thousand year, three thousand people will know them all. But right now, no. Uh, these scales do not address the problems anyway with the ordinary Miller system. They just add more scales. And the Pratt system, on the other hand, is very reductive in the first place. So it really needs some more scales, but the method I showed you by adding fifths to a normal scale is so one way you can get those other scales into the uh, basic uh, uh, canonical scales. So I'm going to suggest that we take 72 and expand it to 108. It's very simple. We take the inversion of the, set of the scales from number 37 to 72, the second half of the net, the ones, and we invert them. The first half has a normal fifth and a normal fourth. So what's going to happen is every scale in the first half of the males is going to invert it to another one. In fact, some invert it to themselves. See, so that's a variant. Other scales will map into other ones. But it's all within this first 36 scales. The second bunch has an F sharp. So, and that will change into a flat fifth put those scales. So I propose that we do the second half of the Melas and add their versions. And so the new of the, the 108 new Melas is closed under inversion. That's very nice because the fourth set class is covered that's very succinctly. And 108 is an auspicious Indian number. You find it a lot in writing and stuff. And even in the case of Talas, the Indian rhythms, there is a collection of 108 of them. So it's a good number <laughs> if you're a numerologist. Um, and then, of course, we can use the Nailus 73 for 108 for rockers that have weak or relative fifths, which is this rock. Now, normally, that'd be classed under some rock or like uh, some scale like this. But it makes more sense to make it from this scale. And then, of course, for instance, Mayo's um, 65 which is the Lydian scale becomes the, uh, uh, the Locrian scale under the transformation. Now, some people have been going further than I'm suggesting. Uh, um, composer John Folds, who lived in England in the first half of the 20th century, and went to India, he got there, um, was very interested in Indian music. And he uh, proposed, why don't we have a flat four rather than a four or also a sharp four? So if you do that, then there's less room for the first the scale roots two and three. And so what happens there, as you can see, there's three possibilities in the flat four. One flat two and flat three, one flat two, and one natural three, one, two, and three. Okay. And then I suggest, why don't we add sharp five, the inversion of that? <coughs> okay. So that gives you now some more possibilities, all right? Uh, and then five, the, and then what happens there is if you use both the sharp four and five five, you get a large span from here to here to fill in with a four that scale degree, and these are the ways you can do it. So in the first case here, we're filling in the notes from one to pitch plus three, okay, and then scale filling in from four to eight, and those are the fifths that are involved in that, fourths and fifths are involved in that are written below. So this is the diminished first tetrachord. This is the wide open fourth and fifth place where these go. And then this is the normal width for uh, the, oh, no, I'm sorry, it's the uh, smaller move here. 
So this gives you three possibilities by eight possibilities by three degrees seven two. In this case, we have um, the normal width of the lower tension corner, and now we have five to eight for the uh, fourth and fifth degree, and from nine to B is diminished in size, so there's three there, six times five times two is ninety. And similarly, this is the inverse of that, and that's this one's interesting because it has um, zero to four, eight to B, and five to seven. So this one has more room for things, and so the one only of those. Nice number again. Total scales is 360, and then they're nice number. Of course, if you write circles, you're going to have 36. 360. So the last thing I want to show you very quickly was the um, 72 megas in possibility. This is the second of that gray code, but I'll show you what happens here. Examine this situation right here. Now, there's going to be one change to get from this scale to this scale. This is two flat, this is kind of two flat and three double flat. This three double flat changes to two, and we introduce also a three double flat here at the same time. So what's going on is that this pitch class, two, is not changing, but this position here is changing its, its scale degree from flat three to plus two. And this is where the change is, the two flat, three flat. So it's not exactly parsimonious because the way it's working is not like this, but like that. So we don't this as opposed to this. That's the problem there. So it's not the greatest. I mean, it's beautiful in a way because it does wrap around and everything. And it's not, and there are many other ways to do it. But you can use the other method I showed you before in the front of the front to do this. So you can see that the Indian music, music has lots of scales in it, and they're known by people that have been studied for many centuries. But they have anomalies to be used in structure. So we're trying to remedy these problems by developing ways to sequence scales by preservation of fifths and by parsimonious sequences. We'll examine particular subsets of the parent scales not recognized by Indian musicologists. We'll enumerate the five and six PC subsets. And by, we can add new scales, especially the 100 base mail system, to remedy some of those problems with education. The thing, the last thing I want to point out is that how important the fifth is in generating these scales. And the Shanta notes, remember, the way that I changed one scale to another by adding a fifth uh, in that manner. So the fifth is really very uh, deeply into the system scales. And I hope these concepts are useful for both Indian and other composers. We shouldn't be using these scales in the proposition composition. I'm not combining this to just Indian practice. These scales are really interesting to fool around with. If you're composing things, you might want to use one of them or even some others based on these principles. So thank you very much. So, first of all, thanks so much for blowing up my mind as usual. So, <laughs> very good shape there. Um, so, uh, my question has to do with the, the notion of hierarchy, and I mean that in both a strict sense and a more ge general sense. The strict sense has to do with you know the, how notes are bent, slide, repeated, or go back, and wonder uh, if you could talk a little bit more about how those. How do those uh, aspects fit within the structure of, of the of the mode? And the, the more general sense of hierarchy has to do with if you want the pedagogy ability of, of the repertoire or the learning process, if you will. Which that might be slightly different. Different. Whether you think the way this the, the repertoire of writers is learned uh, can be. Uh, uh, or one, one can use some of your uh, findings 
to explain you know whether people go from the more simple ones whether they are exploring different properties of the ruggers and kind of build up until the full spectrum or and whether you think you know by uh, uh, studying your your work can, that can also influence the pedagogicality of, of this repertoire. It's a very big question. I'll try to answer some of it by starting at the end. We need to have studies that are based on music based on people's actual practice in music. Uh, there are a lot of studies out there that say certain things happen in all music. Is that found in three of subjects? Listening to Western music. They assume that it's still in all cases. Or there are studies in Indian music which assume other kinds of things that are also not universal. I think it's a big problem of universals. You know, we like to have the world correspond to an idea that we can capture it all. But really, it's not like that. So I use this phrase often. I say, music is not a universal language, it's a universal language. I've been talking about that. Idea of music as a language in my next talk. So, you know, now, so you have a question to add? No, I'm sorry. I just would like to ask you if you know the work of a Brazilian, brilliant musicologist, José Luis Martinez. Yes, I talked to somebody today that he, he unfortunately he died ten years yes. ago, and he published. I don't know if most of the audience know this book, Semiosis. It's a well-regarded book. Sorry. It, it's a well-regarded book. Oh, okay. Yes, but it's not really about music theory. It's about semiotics. Yes. It's how, what are the meanings of ragas and things like that, and how they connect together with culture. It's important, but it's not universal. But my question would be whether various semiotics can be adapted to, in order to explore these kind of universals, uh, since uh, Persian semiotics is. Uh, rather involved with perception and uh, from a quite uh, universal kind of approach. Well, yes, that's a different question about how general or universal uh, uh, semiotics, the theory of signs in accommodation is. Well, I, unfortunately, I the people who invented that were shot down very hard by Derrida in the postmodern era, so I'm not sure really use that theory very well without invoking a certain kind of politics. So that's a different question. But to return to the one that Jose is, um, uh, about, let's start with the hierarchy of the notes. Yes, Wallace had hierarchies. We saw that one word, why? The fourth degree was the one that was important, rather than the fifth. You would have thought, that is the fourth degree. And that makes an interesting problem, because you have to go up there. All right. Now, different models will have different notes that are uh, important. And they're sometimes known as, the, again, the term sound body, and um, the other one is uh, body. Uh, but anyway, there are two notes in the model. One in the lower tempera, and one in the higher tempera. They get uh, important. So they usually fix the part. This is what These two fit are important. They may be important because they slid to them a certain, certain ornamentation on them. Certainly, a, the rather ornamentation in the third year, environment, makes that note stand out. But standing out in salience isn't the same thing as higher work. So you have to watch that. That's a good question. Um, in terms of a, a universal idea, it seems like any note could be a body of a sound body. In, and so consequently, there's no way to say, well, the major scale or something like that is the basis of most products. And there is one guy doing that now that's named Sam Bultigi. He's in Michigan. And he's making a very sophisticated case for the fact that Ragas in the North are somehow related to the ideas of Schenker. Uh, but nevertheless, that's out there. Uh, and now the question about pedagogy. The way pedagogy works in India, especially South India, the the pedagogy system was invented by a man named um, Sam, uh, Sam. And his uh, method was to use the body. In fact, it's the same by Mal Vagala. It's the Byron scale again. And to sing simple songs and do various kinds of a lot of ornamental passages and build it from there. And then he goes to a certain point where you have some simple compositions you learn. And then after that, 
you start working on more complex things, what I call arms, which are important textual compositions in South India. Now, the idea here is that you learn everything by mode from the teacher. The teacher comes in front of you and says, okay, uh, uh, you have to do it exactly his way, and then or her way, and then when that's born, then you do the next part, and then you put together the song as well. Only later does there any cognition that's born here. But it is born here. It's not like it's avoided. It's but the, the main thing is to get good vocal sound, to know a piece by heart so it's part of you, and to develop uh, one particular raga for a long time. In the north, they use the raga yana for that purpose. You might work a year of yana before you taught another raga. So that's the way it's done. It's done by rote and practice before composition. Right. So the idea of having a cognitive theory about um, uh, about learning is not really featured in the Indian way of thinking. Now, in modern times where people are, you know, at contact with the West, there are new things creeping in. Usually you have to use them to have be the case where you study with a guru alone. It's you or maybe two or three other students. Now they use Skype, now they have classes and things like that. So it's become more like Western teaching. And the more conservative people are very concerned about that because they think you're not getting Raga and all that stuff, really deeply rewritten. So there's that aspect to deal with it. But there are people who write in textbooks, which, and, and there's nothing about India, you'll find the same concept developed by all kinds of different people, and they all claim that they're uniquely developed. So, um, you know, and, and sometimes they use the, uh, the old technology method, and they put a few dressing pieces on it, make a little different, but it's the same thing as before. Uh, so there's a, a, there's a tremendous amount of stability in, in, in Indian music that's both good and bad. I'll tell you a story about that because it's kind of a very funny story. I was in Mysore, it's a city in India, South India, and I was asked to address some um, women who were studying vocal music. They were about 20 to 22. And I walked into the class and they didn't speak any English, I didn't speak any um, commas. So we were just looking at each other. There was translators. So, uh, uh, I talked a little about, you know, uh, my interest in music, and then one of the women stood up and said, uh, translate, well, what about, um, what about, uh, you know, modern music is, what is that like? You know, Beethoven, what is it like? And I said, you have to imagine this, that in 50 years from now, people won't be writing music on Ragas and Talas anymore. They'll have a new system completely. And the Indians will look at me like, oh, come on. Okay. <laughs> Congratulations on your brilliant presentation. Thank you. What about the tuning systems, especially the yes. C-Battery? Oh, yes. Okay. That's a really good question. Here's what we find out. There's a lot of writing about intervals in intonation in Indian writing from way back a thousand years. And there's similar things like this in our culture, too, the Italians and the Renaissance, very concerned in how some of the tunings and stuff like that. And of course, mathematically, it's a matter of Um, and now even in modern times, uh, some of the spectral proposals are going to pass uh, what we would uh, like to propose in this way. But the point is that, as I've said many times, in the system where you're using uh, microtones um, uh, or adjusted information, there is no such thing as transposition. Because when you transpose from one scale grade to another, now the intervals change. And that's what they're trying to correct when they make modifications with ordinary faculty uh, tuning because they're trying to get those other tools, which are the transposition are moving things around that don't stay stable. That's why we have the 12 tone system here, which permits us to modulate that to sensitive centers, but in this other system, we can't do that. So now, okay, there's no problem with any music because it's based on one tone, right? Well, the main thing is that we don't know in the ancient cases what those intonations were. We know they existed, and people have been trying to figure it out one way or another and have write lots of treatises on it. We really don't want to know that. It's very important for Indians to have something really way back that's stable that they can base their um, traditions on. Uh, the next aspect of this is that um, for instance, somebody might be playing this rock that we just saw about Bayoba. And uh, one musician said, one teacher said to somebody I knew, it doesn't matter what the intonation of the flat two is. 
can just get it around, you know, the right place. But make sure that A flat is exactly tuned. So again, that's an emphasis on the fifth, but you know, from a floating flow as opposed to you know, making it exactly fit. And I thought that was very exciting. People who have studied, of course, the ornamentations, uh, especially in Indian music, South Indian music, and found that they were really vastly different from each other, and they're different amounts of them. Sometimes they're very tiny, sometimes they're very large. And that depends on who's playing and how to play. Uh, some rogues demand a flatter seventh than normal. Some would demand, you know, a sharper fourth than normal. And of the normal being the normal inclination from, let's say, equal temperament. But that is just understood. They still think of the scale as being like the West with seven scale degrees with 12 uh, attached to it, 16 attached to it. So the intonation occurs in performance, but doesn't occur in the theory, actually. Although a lot of musicians, as I say, want to make it a theoretical situation. So you get a lot of people arguing about what's this or is that. And then you do the measurements with the, you know, this is the spectrum, the spectrum or something like that. And you find that the barriers are the other side. So if you're a person who likes um, mathematical theories of intonation, unfortunately, NDA is the place to go for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Could you explain uh, if they turn the sympathetic strings to the scales? Right. They do it. If, they, if you notice when your sitar is doing that, it's tune this. It's tune this. But they don't change the main. No, the main script, the strings are the ones you play on. You know, you can, no, but the sympathetic scales are the ones that stay, strings are the ones that stay common. And they tune it in a certain way, and if you listen carefully, they'll change it for the next raga. See, so each raga has a different way it has. So, for instance, in uh, Bairava, Bairava B, the second is flat, very low, very low. But in another raga that has to be, uh, it's higher. So they have to, they know what to do, but there's no fixed tuning, tuning for those notes. It depends on the rock. It's like a jazz, it depends on the changes. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, um, thanks for a really stimulating paper. First comment and then question. Comment is when we talked about visiting the classes, and the, you know, the, 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 now they teach versus three or classes, but there's a parallel of course in Western music. We learn from the books and what we are learning from them. Uh, all this stuff is accessible online. The 19th century conservatives is the best way of learning for us for the classes of conservatives. Another thing, she talked a little bit about the relationship between composition and improvisation. Yeah. There's a lot of misleading things that happen in Indian music because one of them is uh, sold to the West um, in the early 60s. There were several things that caused that. First of all, the Ravi Shepard was such a brilliant player. He was bringing in this new entire music to the West. But there were a lot of people playing guitar with slides and things like that. So a common play the whole thing. Um, of course, he was a great showman and a really good uh, entrepreneur. So he had a lot to do with introducing Indian music to the public culture. Unfortunately, his music got typecast as drug trips and things like that. So like those uh, movies where somebody's going to take marijuana or something. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's one thing. Another uh, another aspect was the Beatles, of course, um, who valorized uh, uh, the, the music tremendously, especially Paris. Um, and so that gave credence uh, uh, to this kind of music. But in general, the music is really uh, a lot different than people think. It's just in the, the Indusani tradition, the performances say, well, you know, this performing some of this piece for the Kayao is good politics. Well, the improvisation is very highly valued in like all kinds of situations. You have a theme that you have to work with, you've got a text that you've got to get right to, and you've got to get the music to be in the right places in the top of the rhythmic cycle for a piece to fit just the right way. So just like you could say, well, improvisation with jazz, or you just sit down on the keyboard and play anything. No, you, you know, when it's a matter of um, to know, and it's difficult to master these things. Uh, it's like Frost said he hated poetry and was a blonde because it was like playing tennis without the net. And so uh, I think that's typical about improvisation. So that's the first thing to know. The second thing is people think that Indian music is uh, on the drum side is all improvised. It isn't. They're playing compositions. The drummers have compositions they learn. They alter them and put them together in different sequences. 
Uh, so a model of you here in the background already knew the patterns. And similarly for the instrumentalists in play, that they're learning the patterns that put them together. The improvisation is how you make things fit and how you join things together. There's no such thing as free improvisation. Okay. And in the South, a lot of the concerts are devoted to compositions. And these compositions are not short. They are long. And I played in front of two of this talk. They could be from 1 to 15 minutes long. You learn them exactly right with every ornament and everything in place. And then you might add a little something because you're a major performer to it. But basically, you are learning a complete composition, which includes, as I say, not only the new sequence, but the text, but also all the little variations from one section to the next. By the most, you start with something simple, it's more complicated, you start to repeat it. That's the compositional process often, developing variation, if you like. And uh, that uh, means that uh, the idea of composition is very much alive. In fact, they have three composers, they call the Trinity. And their names are Tia Raja, Rudasoli Dikshitar, and Siyama Shastri. And they live around the time of Bach, Beethoven, and Haydn. So they say, this is our Bach, Beethoven, and Haydn. <laughs> Uh, and they are modern composers too that are not writing film music but writing serious classical music. So uh, it's, a, uh, it's a place for this composition theory. The, the raga is used in both cases. All right. More questions? Yes. Uh, about the uh, ornamentations, shruti's, and something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is there some uh, some kind of a uh, hierarchy of uh, ornamentation rule? Some, some, some steps uh, to Okay, some ornamentation is optional. You can add it or not. You probably don't want to play with none. <laughs> okay, but when you play or, or, or say you want to put some in, and you can do too much of it too, by the way. And so there's a golden mean, a golden monks place for ornamentation. Now, the, uh, some notes have to be ornamented. So, is there a lot? <laughs> It's the seventh scale of uh, 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 Canada, okay. right? Or another scale. Let's take uh, a South Indian one. Da 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 those are obligatory, not a good one. You can even put more in okay? Uh, you can also change them in some ways. So there is a rule for doing it, but it's something you can generalize very hard. In fact, there are treatises on what are the ornaments, which are the ones that are important here. And sometimes you get a set of eight, sometimes they say they're 14, etc. and then they have names, and then you find out when you apply this to the music, it doesn't work out that way. Now, I did a study of uh, looking at one set of performances of South Indian music, which is published um, in the AAU, uh, the American, uh, the Analytic, um, World Music. Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, Analytic Approaches to World Music Conference. I wrote it maybe five years ago. What I did is I took every note and looked at the ornamentation that occurred. And so I had a list of all the ornamentations on scale number five, on six, seven, eight, in a given raga. And what I did is I found them all, and I found there were over a hundred different ways to play those notes in that raga. And then I looked at what are the sequences that would occur. So this particular one goes to that, but not to this one. All right. And so those sequences generated then little cycles of ornamentation. And these cycles of ornamentation were very good descriptors of the local ornamentation in a given performance. So the, uh, so I was working with something like a markup system but making cycles out of it rather than trying to make a hierarchy. And so what happened eventually is I had a nice way of understanding how ornamentation would work with the notes. So the way I'm really thinking about Indian music is it isn't just seven notes or you know, 12 alterations. It's a hundred different notes. Each one of those ornaments makes a different note. And this is justified by this concept of swara, because sometimes musicians will say, well, swara isn't just a note, it's how you play it. You know, so when I proposed this, well, I had 108 notes, and he was looking at me like very strangely. And what did you do slowly last night? Okay. Any other questions? Well, thanks. It's been really nice to uh, present this music. I love
Awesome.